And now we're going to move on to our scientific panel. So the first person that we have joining us is Dr. Wilson. He is uh, Gomery's Chief Scientific Officer. He will then be followed by uh, Dr. McKinney, Dr. Buskey, and Dr. Quay. And I will introduce each of these as we go along. Um, so I'm going to start with Dr. Wilson, and he's going to get our panel uh, off and running. Uh, the only other thing I would like to mention is that we hopefully, we're learning a little bit long, but hopefully we'll have time for a question or two um, for these four at the end of when they're all speaking. So if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box or the comment section on Facebook, uh, and we will um, do our best to get that answered. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen so Jen can get up and running and introduce Dr. Wilson. Dr. Wilson serves as the Gomery Chief Scientific Officer, which provides scientific and research advice and leadership to, to Gomery. Dr. Wilson coordinates the work of the Gomery Research Board, the Gomery Administrative, Administrative Unit, and the funded science projects to implement the research program. He is a distinguished scientist and academic leader, and has held numerous faculty and administrative posts at Louisiana State University, including former director of Louisiana Sea Grant. So with that, we'll introduce Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, great. Thank you very much. And delighted to be here, uh, like everyone else. I, will, I certainly want to thank this uh, rock star group we call the Sea Grant team for organizing uh, these events and certainly their participation over the past eight years. Um, as you heard from John, then Rita, then Laura, this has been an incredible partnership and we think it's an incredible model for future endeavors like this. I certainly also wanna thank the panelists that are gonna follow me. They too have been great partners and I wanted to comment that we have asked a great deal of all three of them. I don't think we're gonna stop asking, but they've been critical in conducting and delivering Gomery Science to the community. Apologies for not being on video. Uh, I am in Fairhope, Alabama. Hurricane Sally hit us pretty hard last week and I just got power back uh, this week, well, middle of this week and still have no internet, but I know our friends in the path of Harvey clearly understand that. Uh, next slide, please. I want to give you a brief perspective on federal investment in the Gulf region and Larry McKinney and I and Laura have been talking about this and this slide is an old slide. It came out of BOEM, we think. Uh, it shows the federal investment in three uh, regions of the country. One is the Great Lakes, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, and the Gulf of Mexico. And as you can see, the Gulf of Mexico, as we all know so well, has really lagged behind, given the size of the body of water that we are involved with, uh, those other two important regions. And I stuck an arrow in to give you an idea of where annual Gomery funding began in 2010 for the Gulf of Mexico. So certainly one of our objectives is to try and, and continue that level of funding because we've learned it is so critical. So that's certainly a challenge to all of you and some of the speakers and panelists involved today. Next slide, Jen. Uh, here's our footprint. Uh, as Rita reported over the past 10 years, we've, we've awarded some $420 million to research teams and consortia, uh, both of which uh, are represented in Texas. And this just gives you an idea of how expansive the, uh, the networking that occurred as a result of Gomery investment, because a requirement was that this had to be, research had to be focused on the Gulf of Mexico and far and away all of our consortia are located in the Gulf of Mexico uh, for the most part. And so, it took this army of researchers from around the country and around the world to help conduct the kinds of research that I'll tell you a little bit about in a, in a minute. So, and as you can see, we have quite a few teams in Texas. You've heard that already. All right, next slide, Jen, please. Or Danny, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna walk through some of the research findings and these are more or less organized by topics. It's impossible to capture all the science and this changes almost every week with new science coming out, but we, we focused a lot of our research on transport. We learned a great deal uh, about transport, but one of them related to the Mississippi River Plume, which certainly affects the coast of Texas. And uh, it created rapidly 
change in circulation patterns and fronts that influence the direction of the oil uh, as it was coming on shore. Uh, it actually shielded some of Texas from the oil because of the way the plume was working at the time. But these uh, plume, these frontal plumes can be expressed 40 to 50 miles offshore. Uh, the next figure down you've heard a lot about already. This is marine snow, uh, a very important process that was docu documented by Dr. Quigg and her colleagues. Um, one of the important parts that we want to make sure people understand is it played a significant role in transporting oil to the bottom, and we now understand that that could be as high as 10 percent of the oil was transported through this process, although there's some debates on that. Last figure you've already heard uh, Dr. Orbach talk about the, uh, the micro droplets of uh, oil that were cast up into the atmosphere from uh, waves and rainfall droplets. What was critical about that was that these droplets were smaller than the hazmat gear filtration of many of the response workers. And we've really gotten the attention of the response community about what is the impact of those small oil droplets on respiratory distress. Next slide, please. Another very important area of investment by Gomery uh, and a prevailing question that Sea Grant hears is what was the fate of the oil? What happened to it? And there have been a number of studies that have uh, looked at that. I've already mentioned uh, that uh, currents had a lot to do with the movement of the oil. In fact, we found that oil was transported to the West Florida Shelf as a result of the subsea surface plume that was documented. Um, We've also documented, and as Dr. Orbach alluded to, the, the footprint of carbon that uh, has, uh, has, is currently still in the Gulf of Mexico and will persist for years to come, and that follows the MOSFA process. And then the effect of dispersants, and many people were concerned about the fate of the hydrocarbon that came on shore, and our researchers documented that uh, if dispersants were mixed into that, that oiled uh, material that came on shore, it actually subsided farther into the sand. The good news is that that, that hydrocarbon was rapidly degraded. Uh, next topic, uh, next slide, Danny. Uh, we talk a lot about dispersants, and there remains intense interest in the dispersant effects uh, on Deepwater Horizon because subsea surface injection had never been done before, and so it happened during Deepwater Horizon, and so we frequently get the question, will you recommend it again? Too many scientific studies have been done to do it justice, but we found that dispersant affected bacterial degradation, which is a very important part of the, um, uh, of the oil response process by the environment. Uh, the second, the middle image was, we had a number of modeling studies that looked at uh, the effect of dispersants uh, I mean, the, the oil will break down with and without dispersant, and we found examples of both. In some cases, it, it hindered as the oil degrading bacteria, and in other cases, there is evidence that it really wasn't needed. Uh, another debate was what did it really serve its purpose? And this has been going on now for about nine years. Initially, modeling indicated that it only marginally reduced surface oil, that's dispersants being injected at the, uh, at the site of the spill. More recently, they are documenting that the, uh, the volatile organic carbons, the fumes, if you will, that you smell at a gas tank were greatly reduced at the surface, which made it more uh, a little safer for the uh, response workers. Next topic, I mean, next uh, slide. Um, biodegradation has been well documented across Gomery studies. We see evidence of microbial response in the marsh on the coastal uh, continental shelf out in the water column and in the deep ocean. And in all these cases, the microbial community rapidly expanded and responded to the presence of the oil. <clears throat> it began to degrade that oil, which was not part of the natural uh, oceanic response process in the Gulf of Mexico. And then that community returned to background levels, maybe not exactly the same as it was before this spill, but it's a very important part of the process that we understand that degradation process um, uh, as it relates to determining the impacts of the oil spill. Scientists have studied the effect of nitrogen on enhancing microbial de degradation. Really a no-brainer to think you throw a little fertilizer on it. The bacteria does a better job because of the uh, presence of nitrogen, which is critical in the microbial degradation process. Uh, what's interesting is there's not much nitrogen way down deep in the ocean where the spill uh, originally occurred, which slowed the process of degradation down there because it 
were learning that there wasn't sufficient nutrients to support that degradation. And in addition, as it indicates in the bottom image, that uh, high pressure also slows the growth and function of oil degrading microbes in the deep ocean. Let's see, next slide. Uh, marsh is actually a better story than many other stories you'll hear in some cases. Uh, we had an army of researchers in Louisiana and Alabama working in the wetlands because that's where people saw the oil coming on shore. I'm sure many of you saw the disheartening images of, of our seabirds and uh, marshes covered in oil at the time of the spill. And as I mentioned, turns out to be some good news and bad news. Where the oil came on shore in Louisiana, there was fairly rapid recovery of the marsh. Uh, one and a half years after the spill came on shore, they were in the process of recovering and four or five years after the spill, some of that marsh area was fully recovered. The exception to that is that where it, the oil was thick enough that it killed the vegetation, it led to loss of the root structure and it caused accelerated erosion of those areas in coastal Louisiana. Uh, a common coastal inhabitant in the marsh areas are dolphins. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, this is a sad story. The, uh, there were early signs of reproductive failure uh, by a lot of the cohorts. Dolphins lived to be 70 or 80 years old, and uh, they documented that uh, only 20% of the pregnancies were successful in coastal Louisiana, compared to 80% in reference populations in Florida and California. Uh, Dolphins were also unable to avoid oil fume and uh, oil exposure as they were breathing, and you know how dolphins breathe. And so they've documented uh, conditions like COPD and emphysema in some of the uh, dolphin populations that are studied in coastal Louisiana. So uh, that group will continue to study that because that's a long-term recovery process and it's likely that those who are impacted will never recover. We also documented uh, decades-long persistence of harmful hydrocarbons in the marshes. When the oil came on shore, it went down the holes of crabs and burrowers, got down into the anaerobic zone, and you can still today go stick a shovel in some of the marshes of Louisiana and detect and measure and smell that oil. As the marshes erode away, that oil will be exposed and it causes re-oiling -oil events. Uh, next slide, Danny, please. Uh, we have a number of studies in the deep water communities. Uh, some of these are absolutely fascinating. Uh, the one I think is most intriguing is the mesopelagic community. Uh, this is a very poorly understood community in the deep waters of the Gulf and most oceans. Uh, it's called mesopelagic and it's made up of crustaceans, large plankton, young fish, and some adult fish like this angler fish you see a picture of. Uh, they're very uh, interesting photographically. Around the oil site, the number of these organisms declined precipitously following the spill and they have yet to recover. Now we know we don't know much about it, but what we do know is they're critical prey items for things like migratory whales. So we're trying to fed, thread together what the consequences of that population reduction. Fortunately, that team has continued to be funded under, uh, under some of the uh, um, penalty money and uh, uh, Nerd to find money, and so that story will continue. Also down in the deep ocean, not far from the spill, we have this really unique community of soft corals. These corals are, are uh, really interesting looking. They're inhabited by a, a number of organisms, uh, including some echinoderms. And it was evident where the spill occurred, they were beginning to die back. We had branch loss. These uh, corals have been documented to be 800 years old, so where they were damaged, we're looking at a very large recovery uh, period. And finally, another note on bacteria in deep ocean, we did document the response of a, uh, a bacterial community that actually eat methane. Now, you know methane is a gas, but it was dissolved in water, and these microbes can actually assimilate methane and, and help accelerate its decomposition. Uh, I think this is the last slide on uh, results. Number of food web studies, again, the question is, how does the oil get into the food web and what happens to it? This relates to early concerns that Sea Grant helped us field about sea grant, seafood safety. We heard, as a Sea Grant director, we heard immediately, is the seafood safe to eat? Um, scientists found that phytoplankton abundance was initially impacted and dropped way off in 2010. That affected the food web. Uh, we found, as Dr. Orbach had mentioned, that coastal marine animals actually assimilated carbon from deep water horizon, both by ing ingesting bacteria that 
were enriched with oil carbon and also by eating zooplankton that had previously grazed on, um, on oil. And then the effect on deep sea fishes, we're still getting information about that, but tile fish is a common commercial species out in the deep water of the Gulf. Uh, they live in burrows. <clears throat> Those burrows are lined with oiled marine snow, and so being in contact with that oiled marine snow that's now in the sediment, they're still assimilating uh, uh, carbon, oil carbon, into their system, and we find indications of oil contamination in their livers and gallbladder. Um, that's that's a quick synopsis of our research findings, and they're very abundant. I certainly recommend you go to our website if you'd like to see more of the really interesting stories. Uh, one of the things I wanted to comment on is the collaborative science community around Gomery. It really has been fascinating and a joy to watch this evolve, and it's going to be one of the long-term, long-lasting beneficial aspects of the Gomery program. And uh, there have been a number of spills since. Deepwater Horizon, and we had an armed group ready to respond. Hercules gas blowout happened in the mid-Gulf about 2015, and Gomer scientists responded immediately. Similarly, there was an oil spill in Galveston Bay, and Dr. Quigg and her team were able to respond to that. And researchers made comments such as having Gomer scientists on speed dial created an efficient response network. And Dr. Quigg even said that um, all the researchers who responded commented that on her team, they did the Galveston spill as being part of a larger, well-funded science community enabled them to learn a lot more than they would have otherwise. And we had other community-related interactions with all of our researchers. We had a hydrocarbon calibration experiment that challenged how well our researchers were measuring hydrocarbons using various techniques. You've already heard about marine oil snow. Dr. Quigg has had a lot to do with that, and we've had dispersant discussions. So those are just examples of the kind of collaborative activity we've had. Uh, next slide. You've heard a lot about these already, but what is the Gomery legacy? And Rita commented on this. Certainly the impressive amount of research funding that has gone in to the Gulf region has elevated our state of knowledge uh, way beyond where it would have been had that not happened. Not a good thing, not a bad thing. You've heard about networks between all the scientists, the wonderful graduate students, the conference series that we look forward to, Laura and Larry leading the continuation of, and the massive contribution to the scientific literature, which Rita highlighted. Uh, finally, and Rita mentioned this last slide, Danny, is uh, we are now conducting this comprehensive synthesis work. Rita mentioned that. All three of our panelists are involved in our synthesis, as are all of our researchers. And this is a very important part, which we didn't forecast at the beginning of Gomery, but we got involved in two years ago. So please stay tuned. Look for Sea Grant presentations over the next two or three years that will relay those findings. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Danny. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chuck. Up next is Dr. McKinney. Dr. McKinney is the recently retired director of the Heart Research Institute for the Gulf of Mexico Studies and is currently the chair of Gulf Strategies at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Prior to working at HRI, he was the director of aquatic resources with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Service. And in that position, Dr. McKinney was involved in various activities, working towards water quality and conservation in Texas, establishing sustainable fisheries in the Gulf and surrounding waters, and guiding Seagrass Task Force monitoring the health and status of Texas bays and estuaries and performing other general resource protection. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate it. And while she's putting that up, I, um, uh, I want to, I'm very happy to hear from Chuck that he has electricity again uh, down there. I know how important that is. If you live on the Gulf Coast after, after hurricanes, the most important thing could happen pretty much is getting your electricity back. So glad to hear that, Chuck. And I appreciate Chuck's introduction. It really makes my, my presentation uh, uh, more focused and, and directed to where we're, we're heading. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, about the trajectory of Gulf research, and you, you got that wonderful perspective uh, from all of our previous speakers of, of what um, Gomery has uh, uh, has achieved. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, uh, Danny, please. And I think I want to put a little context in first. Why why are we uh, even concerned about this? What what's the fuss? And I'll make just make a quick slide of case of, of why the Gulf of Mexico is so important, and the fact that a resilient Gulf of Mexico is important, because it really is a keystone uh, 
resource, an aquatic resource for the North America and the USA. Uh, trapped as it is between the east and west coasts and underlying the huge infrastructure the remainder of the country. Uh, it provides uh, a really important economic and ecological functions. It's kind of outlined here. And uh, if you hit the next slide, next please. Uh, the goal, of course, is how do you keep all of this in, in balance uh, to make sure that uh, the Gulf continues to produce all of the uh, ecosystem services and, and economics that we, we count on, yet staying healthy and productive itself. Uh, next. And maintaining that balance requires a sustained Gulf of Mexico research. Gomery has, has, uh, has set a really high standard, has put a, bar, a standard, a bar, raised the bar uh, considerably about what we need. Uh, and we need to continue that now that uh, Gomery is, is winding down to its conclusion. Uh, and that's what I want to focus on a bit. And not everyone believes that. Uh, back in, uh, after this bill in 2011, as we were going through a, a lot of analysis and trying to understand this, I had the chance to have a discussion with, with a leader of a well-known major American foundation. I won't, I won't give the name particularly, but if you want to know it, uh, give me a call and I'll tell you. Uh, and they made this statement directly to me that the Gulf is an industrial sea, is not worth uh, the investment from their perspective. So we're going to go where we have uh, an impact. Uh, and that was um, a kind of a stunning statement, but not one that was um, unusual for the time because of what some people believed about the Gulf and didn't know about it. Uh, next, please. And that and that um, that extended, frankly, to the federal government. Uh, Chuck had this slide up here. This was a slide, by the way, it's, it's, uh, uh, that I I got uh, from uh, uh, contacting EVA back in. Uh, 2011, right after this bill, and uh, it really is a, it's a focus of, uh, I think it's an example of federal spending. This is EPA uh, dollars, but and they were the ones who were able to give me the, the data, were willing to do it. They quickly pulled that off their website uh, after it kind of got well known, but this is the point that Chuck has made, that the Gulf never uh, got the amount of attention uh, that any other uh, area like Chesapeake Bay, that small little dot up there in the upper right of your, your slide compared to the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf never got that attention and funding from the research side of thing from any of the agents. And that's reflected in the uh, productivity and in, in the reports and studies and, and uh, peer-reviewed articles about the Gulf. And I put this together uh, just to kind of make that point of looking at uh, uh, the attention paid to the Gulf until uh, about 1990 and really back in 1973, and I was trying to discern uh, why, what began the upward climb of that. Uh, next, please. And really what it amounts to is the times that we pay attention to the Gulf of Mexico is was with the Arab or, uh, oil embargo and the Gulf War. So in times of crisis, particularly related around oil, uh, then the Gulf gets the attention it needs, otherwise no. Uh, and that's with the exception of one federal agency, and I want to give an appropriate shout out to the Minerals Management Service, or now BOEM because they started in 1973 um, uh, looking at the Gulf and expending funds there in research. And so from 1973 to 2010, they invested over a billion dollars in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, producing some 1,800 projects and 3,600 reports that, that, uh, that are reflected here. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, that ignorance, uh, our, our lack of understanding of the Gulf of Mexico, our ignorance of the Gulf was really laid bare starting with this, the tragic incident, as Rita mentioned, with the loss of lives uh, and, and the environmental impact of Deepwater Horizon. And then we really realized we didn't know enough about the Gulf of Mexico to protect it or, or restore it. And so this was, uh, which I greatly appreciate the, the uh, BP's uh, launch of the program and Rita's leadership and the board and all that has been done by Gomery to, to, to uh, respond to that. And so uh, you've heard uh, from Chuck's summary in particular, which, which I think was really, uh, really well done in a very short time of all the work that Gomery uh, researchers have done, uh, launched in the program and really began to turn around our understanding of the Gulf of, uh, of Mexico and how it works and, and so forth. That brings me to the, the point I wanted to talk about uh, at, at this point is, is one of the aspects of Gomery that both Rita, which I appreciate the allude to, and Chuck did as well about uh, the Grid C group and, and that and what we're talking about there. And I, I had the opportunity when uh, the program for coming together, Gomery program has come together to have some input on uh, areas that, that ought to be looked at. And this was one of them, that making sure that what was learned over that 10 year period and $500 million was not lost. And in that I had a couple of mentors, 
uh, that really helped uh, help me solidify what I knew already. Because uh, I uh, I spent about half my career as um, as was noted with Parks and Wildlife, and I helped establish the NERDA uh, program in in Texas. Was the first designated uh, natural resource trustee in the state, and and led the Parks and Wildlife response to oil spills over that that period of time. And so I was acutely aware of what we didn't know about how to respond and, and recover from, from those oil spills. But for but the what really inf reinforced that for me here at HRI were, were two individuals. The first, uh, Wes Tunnel, who of course is, is now passed, unfortunately. But Wes led the uh, research uh, for NOAA on Ixtoc uh, spill uh, at the time. Uh, and then uh, Jim Dubow, who you're going to hear from in a moment, uh, Jim was uh, very much involved in the Exxon Valdez uh, uh, spill as well. And so they they also understood this uh, this issue of of not uh, losing what we might have learned uh, regards these spills. And if you'll hit next, please. And what we found out is from Mixtoc, we learned almost nothing. Uh, as soon as the uh, the Mexican government and PMEX really was not uh, interested in, in letting much information out about that spill, it might be understandable. Uh, and as soon as it was stopped, uh, as soon as the, the, the spill was uh, was brought to an end, all research into there. And we really didn't have much coming out of that. Uh, Dr. Tunnel collected most of those uh, those research papers and there were total only 58 that we could discover. Exxon Valdez, uh, they did a much better job. In fact, I know Gomri uh, uh, worked very closely with the, the research board there to, to learn some lessons there. And they and they did and, and still are active in that regard of trying to make sure. But nonetheless there, uh, as Dr. Jabot has told me on a couple of occasions, that he's been contacted by researchers trying to find data that uh, that were that, that has been lost and sitting in someone's uh, file cabinet or on a floppy disk or something like that, that type of thing. So we were determined uh, to not let that happen uh, with uh, Agamri and the work that we did uh, here. Uh, and that was the the genesis of Grid C, which is the single greatest collaboration of Gulf scientists ever. And this is a the numbers where it is today out off the off the website and it grows frankly, almost every day. So, uh, so, uh, and I'm not going to say much more about that. Rita gave a wonderful summary of it and uh, Dr. Jabot is going to talk more about it. So I don't, I just want to, to make the point uh, that this, I think, is one of the long-term legacies, one of the most significant accomplishments of, of Gomri, other than the actual research or work that they did themselves, just to make sure, is to make sure uh, that nothing that the Gomri researchers have discovered uh, will not be, it will be accessible, and it is. Uh, and you can find anything from peer-reviewed papers to reports and data, that information will be available to scientists and managers and policymakers, uh, hopefully forever, but, but certainly for a substantial uh, period of time. And so I think that's going to be a great legacy of Gomri to make sure that what we have learned uh, is carried forward. And I can't say that that uh, that will be the case for other research programs going forward. I hope it is. We're certainly working with them to try to make sure it is. And I think they're committed that way. And I'm hoping that they will follow uh, Gomri's uh, lead in making sure that what we learn over this period of time, the greatest intensive research focus on the Gulf of Mexico ever, we've learned more about the Gulf of Mexico in the last 10 years than in all the time before that. Hopefully that all of that going forward will be available for future scientists. And so that's what I want to, uh, and, and I'll be working on even in re retirement, is to make sure that we have an active and focused and sustained research enterprise going well beyond Gomri. Gomri has uh, made the model. They've, they've uh, set a high standard. They raised the bar uh, for doing this. We need to make sure that that, uh, that happens as we go forward. Uh, right now, uh, our, the research programs that are following up and beginning to get their feet under them uh, after being in place for five years, uh, they have, uh, uh, they have a, uh, something to look at, uh, to aspire to. And we're not there yet with any of those programs, but the model that Gomery has set uh, will be key in guiding that in the future. And so I just want to thank Rita, the board, Chuck, Mike Karen, all of the researchers that were part of, of Gomery for what they've done for the future of the Gulf of Mexico to make sure it is healthy and sustainable. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to make this brief presentation. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Buskey. Dr. Buskey is the director of the Gomery Drops Consortium, so Dispersion Research on Oil, Physics, and Plankton Studies. 
He joined the University of Texas Marine Science Institute in 1986 as a research scientist and was promoted to professor in 1999. His research interests in marine science have focused on studies of the behavioral ecology of marine zooplankton and how sensory perception mediates behavioral adaptations for local food resources, avoiding predators and finding mates. Much of this research makes use of video microcinematography and automated video computer methods for imaging and motion analysis. And I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. Thank you for the introduction, Danny. As has been mentioned, so I, I was had the privilege of being the director of the DROPS Consortium, which uh, is dispersion research on oil, physics, and, and plankton studies. And so again, I'm just going to talk to you today about just a couple of highlights from that. There was an awful lot of different uh, findings we had within this project, but I'll just uh, take the time to highlight just a couple of those. So anyway, just, just four things I want to mention recently. I'll, I'll mention some studies where we uh, developed a method to uh, better predict the amount of oil that was coming out of a damaged well, basically to be able to look at the relative proportions of oil and water in a plume coming out of a, a, a damaged well on the bottom of the ocean uh, through some laboratory studies. Uh, we also, as I think has been previously mentioned, we also had uh, built a number of different wave tanks and looked at various physical processes to see how uh, waves and raindrops and other bubbles and things like that, how they would uh, break up particularly dispersant treated oil and break it up into small particles, some of which go in the atmosphere and some of which, which would be distributed in the water column and how that affected human beings as well as potentially as, and, as wildlife. And, and then also these small droplets that are in the water column will also, were the same size range essentially as the food of a lot of zooplankton. And so I'll mention some, show some examples of how those were actually directly uh, ingested by organisms at the base of the food web. And then finally, just, uh, you know, it's very, marine food webs are very complex. And so the fact we, we did a number of studies looking at the lethal and sublethal effects of oil on these organisms. And we found that there's a lot of difference in the degree of response to them. So we also did some microcosm experiments just to see how this might alter the structure of marine food webs. Next. So again, is this picture in the, the center here is a picture of the Deepwater Horizon plume. And so there's a real challenge to try to figure out how much oil is in that because you, the oil is opaque and it's a very dense drop, uh, cloud of oil droplets. And so it's really hard to know what proportion of oil and water are in that. And this is important uh, for just trying to know the, the total amount of oil that's being released into the environment. So scientists in our group uh, developed a method where they used a transparent oil and a transparent water solution that had the same refractive index. So when we pass light through it, it wouldn't distort the images. And these fluids also had the exact same properties, physical properties as crude oil and seawater. And so then, as you can see in this lower uh, image of our setup, we put a laser sheet through there and we're able to create a plume in the laboratory and then look at that in detail. So we put a uh, fluorescent dye in the oil. So the oil is the white substance that you see and uh, the water is, is dark in the background. And so if you look at that last bottom figure over on the right hand side, you can see these droplets and we were surprised to find that they were quite a bit more complex in their uh, composition than we expected. Next slide, please. So these are close-ups of these, and you can see these, these uh, droplets are much more, again, much more complex. So within oil droplets, there were additional water droplets and sometimes additional oil droplets within that. And so again, depending upon the physical properties of the way that oil was coming out of the, 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 the leak and, and how that plume was formed, uh, depending upon you know, Reynolds numbers and, and shear and that sort of thing would depend on how these oil droplets formed. And so again, this allows a better, not only empirical data on this process, but also a better theoretical understanding. And again, it's important to understand you know, in these plumes how much oil there is. And also by having water in these droplets, it also affects the buoyancy of these uh, droplets and it'll determine how quickly they're going up to the surface. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, we also built a number of wave tanks to try to look at the breakup of oil 
You can see again on the right hand side here, a number of uh, frames from high speed videos. So we would put a, a small circle of oil on the surface of the water and create waves. And some of that wave, and particularly with the uh, dispersant treated oil, uh, that oil would be broken up into very small droplets, some of which would be distributed into the water. But we also discovered that a number of these were also very small droplets were being splashed up into the atmosphere as well, up into the air. And so we decided to look at that in a little bit more uh, detail. So we're very concerned about this. Uh, again, we, from a number of different sources, we found that these, particularly with dispersant treated oil, that very small uh, oil droplets were being spread up into the, into the atmosphere. And so these uh, marine uh, oil aerosols, we, we developed uh, some scientists that are a member of our consortium at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health uh, were looking at basically had human lung epithelial cell cultures that they could use. And this uh, setup that's shown in the middle here, basically we would add the uh, oily aerosols to this chamber. And then we had a high speed video system that could then actually record the movements of the cilia on the lung epithelial cells. So we could dose it with this uh, oily aerosol and, and immediately see the response of these cilia, which are normally involved in sort of clearing out particles out of the lungs. And they also were able to do longer term experiments to look at the overall impact of, of these oily aerosols. Uh, and then we're also very interested in trying to understand, you know, the small oil droplets that are spread uh, into the ocean, try to understand what impact that had on, uh, on the base of the marine food web, which would be made up of phytoplankton uh, and, and zooplankton. And again, that, so the, the image on the left here shows sort of the complexity of a typical marine food web. And then on the right hand side, it just shows it more as a food chain with all the different uh, groups of organisms that would make that up. And so I'm going to show you two examples, one from the microzooplankton, which is circled, and then from the mesozooplankton that shows that these organisms are actually uh, directly ingesting these oil droplets as well from these, these small oil droplets that are produced when you have a uh, dispersed oil. So in addition to being exposed to the dissolved toxins that oil, crude oil leaves in the water, they also were directly ingesting these. So this just shows some examples of uh, protozoa here. So we have uh, heterotrophic dinoflagellates in these uh, slides. And so for example, you can see in, in uh, image B and then the image C next to it. So image B, you can see some dark globules in the food vacuoles of these protozoa but you really don't know whether they're oil or not. When you expose it to UV light under the microscope, uh, crude oil glows, uh, fluoresces uh, under UV light. So you can see those white spots. So that shows which ones of those are actually crude oil. And similarly, you can see that for another species in ENF. So again, these organisms, even these small uh, single-celled organisms were directly ingesting some of these small oil droplets. And then, uh, larger uh, zooplankton like these copepods were also ingesting this, uh, these small oil droplets. And again, you can see in the series of figures on the right hand side here, three different species of copepods. And again, these oil droplets are again in the similar size range as the phytoplankton food and the protozoa that they normally feed on. And again, in the right hand panels, you can see uh, where under fluorescent light that you can actually see some of these small oil droplets within their uh, digestive systems. And then on the bottom uh, panel, you can see, I'm sure all of you are curious about this, but on the left hand side, you can see a copepod fecal pellet. So again, this is a, these are the uh, waste materials that they produce when they're feeding. And you, it looks like there's small oil droplets on there. And again, if you look on the right hand side under fluorescent microscopy, you can in fact confirm that there are numerous small oil droplets within these fecal pellets. These fecal pellets sink, and this is another source of getting some of this oil back down to the bottom of the ocean, similar to the MOFSA that uh, Antoinette will talk about. And then finally, just to look at another example, we actually, again, they, we went out and did some experiments where we took natural assemblages of planktonic organisms and exposed them to oil. And again, we found that, again, because some of these were more sensitive to oil than others, it actually changed the structure of the marine food web. So in this case, and this actually is corroborated by some of the uh, studies we did in the laboratory on single species, but we generally found that things like tintinids and ciliates, which are the two uh, organisms on the left-hand side there, 
uh, which are normally grazers on phytoplankton, these were among the most sensitive protozoa in the water column to oil. And so these charts are just showing you how the population numbers decline uh, with increasing uh, exposure to either crude oil alone or in the bottom panels uh, dispersed crude oil. And again, now you see in the next two panels next to that where it's marked autotrophic, mixotrophic dinoflagellates and heterotrophic dinoflagellates, that at the same time, these organisms were increasing in abundance as oil concentration increased. So it's not that the oil makes them grow faster, it's that they're being released from their predators, from their grazers, uh, who are more affected by the soil. So again, you can see that this kind of have an effect on uh, the food web structure. And again, it seems that, for example, that it can actually lead to the formation of blooms of dinoflagellates, which are sometimes referred to as red tides. So again, and the number of red tides have been reported uh, in association with uh, following oil spills. And then finally, uh, this and all, a lot of other uh, elements that we did were put together. We worked with a group called Sintef in Norway, which has this uh, model called Oscar oil spill contingency and response. And so basically a lot of the empirical data we received about how you know, the oil is breaking up and uh, creation of the aerosols and the impacts on different organisms were answered into this uh, to improve models uh, to try to help uh, responding uh, organizations know uh, exactly what the impacts of you know, dispersal applications and other strategies to uh, deal with oil spills, what, what's further understand where the oil is going to end up and what impact it's going to have on the environment. Anyway, and again, so, you know, uh, just to reiterate, so again, that the research that we did in this, in this uh, consortium then greatly helped us with our overall understanding of, of how oil behaves in the environment and how it impacts the food web in the Gulf. And again, uh, this was mostly done in, in laboratory type experiments and then uh, also then to uh, try to inform uh, the model uh, to help uh, responders. And, and also I'd like to point out that, again, we worked with a great group of engineers in here and used a lot of advanced optical techniques and other uh, new technologies were developed and they were shared across disciplines. So we helped train biologists, chemists uh, with some of these uh, advanced techniques that were developed by the engineers in our consortium. And then finally, as has already been mentioned, uh, a lot of new scientists were trained. So we had a lot of graduate students, postdocs, who are already becoming the, the future professors and research scientists that are well equipped to deal with future oil spills. Excellent, thank you very much, we appreciate it. Um, if anyone has any questions for our last three speakers and upcoming Dr. Quick, please write it in the chat. Um, if not, we will just sort of continue with our program and that's not a problem at all. So up next, we have uh, Dr. Quick. Dr. Quick is a research scientist of the Gomery Adamex Consortium and Senior Associate Vice President for Research and Graduate Students. Uh, she's located at Texas A&M University, Galveston. So Adam X investigates the impact of spilled oil and dispersants of the formation of an extracellular matrix formed by marine microbes that is thought to be instrumental in determining the fate of oil. This formation by marine microbes can aid in the formation of marine snow that is important in the self-cleansing capacity of natural waters. And I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. Thank you, Danny, and thank you to the um, previous presenters for setting the stage um, for a lot of the pieces um, of, of the talk that I'm going to give you today. And I've taken a slightly different um, tact in um, my presentation and will fo focus a little bit less on the science and um, a little bit more on the people and, and the work that we did. Um, so, Danny, when you're ready to start, um, please start. Um, and so thank you to um, Chuck, Rita, uh, Bray and all the others for setting a wonderful stage and for establishing a wonderful program and I feel really privileged um, to be um, one of the consortia leaders and, and I call it a privilege because um, it, it's given me amazing opportunities, um, not only to do some fabulous science, but to work with um, 
amazing people across the Gulf and, and around the world. And I really have valued that experience. The consortia that I was able to lead um, was the Adamex Consortia, and we looked at the um, aggregation and degradation of dispersants and oil by microbial exopolymers. And um, unlike a lot of the other consortia, we were interested very much in what the microbial community was doing. Um, and, and this premise that um, microbes play a role, an important role in oil spill cleanup. So um, as, as has mentioned um, earlier, um, the Deepwater Horizon was a tragic um, accident that killed 10 lives um, injured 17 um, folks and possibly numerous more um, and created many, many hardships for um, the people that live and work in the Gulf of Mexico. But it also created um, an amazing opportunity. Um, and so on the left hand um, part of the screen, you see the um, days after the spill as the uh, fire was being put out, as uh, oil was being herded and um, dispersants and other mechanisms were being used to contain the oil spill and the, and the consequences of the spill. And if you look on the right hand side, um, this is a schematic of um, the microbial community in a, um, in a clean, happy ocean. And in that scenario, um, they're photosynthesizing and producing food for um, higher parts of the food web. Um, it's an important mechanism for the drawdown of carbon dioxide into the ocean. Um, phytoplankton in particular um, uh, form the base of the food web for zooplankton, um, which is what Ed studies and, and other higher trophic levels. And in their normal no, normal day to day when they're doing business, um, they're very good at producing marine snow. And this marine snow material here, you've got uh, an image of a variety of um, phytoplankton and even some zooplankton. And in their day-to-day, -day, um, they release exopolymers. And uh, these polymers are released in um, what we believe is a strategy to protect themselves from oil, um, but other kinds of pollutants that occur in the marine environment. And I often liken this material to the exopolymers that we as humans produce um, when we have colds and flus or allergies. Um, and so these are um, very inexpensive for the microbes to produce and they can produce them in vast quantities. And um, as a result of their production, um, we find that um, the pollutants um, will attach or be um, glued on to the microbes and eventually sink to the bottom, bottom of the ocean. Uh, next, please, Danny. And so as a result of this um, natural process, um, when we have an oil spill, what we now know is that uh, oil can become trapped in this marine snow material. And the schematic on the right um, shows you what we think may be going on. And um, the process as a whole was studied um, very, very well um, as part of the Gomerai effort. And we um, thank the board for their support of that. And um, MOSFA, which you've heard several times this morning, is marine oil snow sedimentation and flocculent accumulation. So really understanding how oil alters the pathway of this marine snow material to the sediment. And um, what are the consequences of that, both for the oil and the microbial communities? Um, for the oil, we know that up to 30% um, of the um, oil was returned to the sediments, um, possibly by this process. Um, the estimates vary from 5 to 30%, but we know this was an important um, mechanism. And um, through the efforts um, of uh, those interested or those that participated in the Ixtoc oil spill, we now know that um, MOSFA also occurred in that oil spill. So there's a, an argument that this was not just important for the Deepwater Horizon, but also um, possibly for other oil spills um, going on. What I really wanted to talk um, 
more about um, if you if you want to know more about the science please reach out to me please look on our website um, but what I really wanted to, to spend the rest of the talk talking about was the impact of the Gomeri program on Texas and on um, science in general so the Adamex consortium was made up of a number of universities and the lo their logos are shown below and um, you've seen slides that show you that um, Gomeri find, funded researchers all over the country as well as um, other countries. And so um, just in Texas alone, uh, the number of faculty, staff, students that were involved in the Gomeri program had a huge and um, definitely beneficial impact on the state of Texas. Next, please, go, um, Danny. Um, next two, please. So um, this is a, a photo of our, our little group. Um, and I say little group because I know we were one of the smaller consortia. And if you can see the box on the top right hand corner, it shows you that over the five year period, there were more than 100 people involved in our project. And I'm really, really proud of that. And I, especially the, um, the, um, I want to say the, the range of age, ages involved. So if you look on the um, left-hand corner, you'll see Peter Sanchi, who's going to turn 80 next year. And if you look at the bottom front row, you see some high school students that are now um, doing their undergraduate degrees and everyone in between. Um, we were able to support an amazing number of graduate students and postdocs with this program. Um, 19 postdocs that are now either research scientists or, um, or um, professors at universities and all sorts of other things. I'm also really, really um, proud that we were able to support so many undergraduate students. You'll see that um, at last count we had supported 48 students um, with the program in just a period of five, uh, five years. We we're also um, able to support a large number of high school students and some of those um, high schoolers are, are pursuing careers in environmental chemistry. Uh, next please, Danny. And just, just following along with that theme of um, training the next generation, Danny, if you just want to click through the next few um, figures, that would be fabulous. Um, these are just some of the faces on the team. Um, some of these folks, one more click. <laughs> um, some of these folks are still in Texas. Um, some of these folks have um, moved elsewhere. Um, but you can see that, um, again, we trained uh, an amazing cross-generation of um, people as part of the Adamex project and these folks are now in academia, um, they're now in working in nonprofits, um, they're now um, pursuing careers in industry and the one thing that I feel that Gomeri enabled us to do which no other um, funding opportunity has allowed us to do um, previously um, and I hope we may have the opportunity again in the future was to be able to bring in a huge amount of talent um, and have them work together side by side. Um, there's some images on the left hand screen um, where you have biologists with engineers and chemists with modelers and high school students with senior professors and um, just an amazing plethora of people that um, in a very, very short period of time came together to solve really, really important and complex questions. And as this generation moves forward in their careers, they've all had an amazing and unique opportunity to work on a really, really complicated project um, and do some wonder wonderful science. And for those that and now in industry or now in nonprofits, I hope that they take those lessons learned um, and apply them as they go forward into the future. And I hope that those um, people in particular uh, create um, bridges and networks um, for future scientific um, endeavors. So next please, Danny. 
And along those terms, um, I really wanted to talk about the uh, outreach and education that we were able to do through um, community engagement. And I'd really like to thank C Grant for their support in facilitating a lot of the activities that we were able to do. Um, and, you know, I've, I've got an image, um, which hopefully you guys can see on the left there, of just some of the fun um, activities that we had. Um, we were able to work with scout groups. We were able to participate in um, annual events like World Ocean Day and Earth, Earth Day, um, the Science Olympiad and various other activities. We were able to um, bring what we were doing to um, various academies like the Texas Academy of Science. Um, we were able to work through uh, with K through 12 and um, even teacher training events. And those teacher training events are particularly impactful because we know that those teachers are going to be training the next generation uh, of students for many, many years to come. And, and that oil spills and um, the response of the microbial community is now gonna be part of those conversations. Um, and with the help of Seat Grant in particular, uh, we were able to share what we were doing um, in workshops with first responders, with folks at state and federal agencies, um, with local incident command team um, groups. And um, as you might imagine, you know, for folks working with um, what I like to call the charismatic megafauna, you know, the, the turtles, the dolphins, the fish, you know, everybody is interested in those kinds of things. Everybody connects to those kinds of things very, very easily. Um, but the microbes are tough. It's, 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 it's um, much more difficult to get in community engagement when you're talking about microbes. But I think as a result of the work that we did um, with the support of Gomerai, um, the outreach efforts we were able to do with the support of Sea Grant. Um, we have now introduced a, a whole generation of folks to microbes, um, phytoplankton in particular, and their importance um, in food webs, their importance in um, being part of nature's system for cleaning up after an oil spill. Um, and I thank uh, Chuck um, for his unwaving support over the years and everyone else on the board as and C Grant as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much.